Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Healthy Connections About Us and How You Can Help. Today's session is being recorded and will be archived on the um, Healthy Connections website for those who could not attend today's live session. And I'm Crystal Welch with Quality Insights, one of the presenters for today's webinar. And before we begin, uh, just please be advised that during today's presentation, uh, we'll have opportunities for questions and comments. And since most of you are listening today through your computer speakers, uh, when the opportunity does arise, I just use the chat or the uh, uh, Q&A feature uh, that's located on the right side of your uh, WebEx player. And we'll address as many questions as time will allow at the end of the presentation. As a reminder, all lines for today's webinar are muted. Uh, so even if you called in on the uh, teleconference number, uh, just please still use the Q&A or chat uh, feature for questions or for feedback. Let me advance the slide here. So um, we, uh, for today, the, the topics, uh, we're going to be providing an overall introduction um, of Healthy Connections. And we're also going to be addressing NAS, or Neonatal Abstinence Syndrome. Um, and we'll also familiarize ourselves with uh, Lily's Place. And then finally, uh, we're going to spotlight one of our Healthy Connections partners, uh, which is Quality Insights. Uh, so I, I've done a quick introduction of myself. I'm Crystal Welch with Quality Insights. So joining alongside me today will be Lynn O'Connell, PhD, uh, with Marshall Health, and uh, Rebecca Crowder with Lily's Place, and also Shannon Wright with Quality Insights. So at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, Lynn O'Connell, Ph.D. Uh, Dr. O'Connell is the Associate Director of Community Services for Marshall Health and an Assistant Professor in the Department of Family and Community Health at Marshall University Jones C. Edwards School of Medicine. Uh, Lynn helps advise and implement and grow Marshall uh, Health's community-based services related to addiction care uh, treatment and its underlying causes. Um, but before joining Marshall Health in 2018, uh, Dr. O'Connell served as the Clinical Director of Marshall University's ESPERT uh, program, which is the Screening, Brief Intervention, and Referral to Treatment program. Uh, so in addition to her nine years of clinical experience, uh, she's also authored and co-authored numerous publications. Uh, she's done many, many presentations, uh, worked on a lot of grants uh, for this area, and so uh, we're, we're very uh, thankful to have her uh, to present this morning. And she, Dr. O'Connell holds a um, Master of Arts in Marriage and Family Therapy from University of Connecticut, and she also earned her PhD degree, PhD degree um, in Marriage and Family Therapy from uh, Virginia Tech in Blacksburg. So she's a licensed ma marriage and family therapist. And so with that, I am going to uh, turn it over to uh, Lynn, and, uh, and she can begin our webinar. So Lynn? Great. Thanks so much, Crystal. Um, and thank you to Quality Insights and uh, everyone for joining us today. So first, I wanted to share a little bit about Healthy Connections um, and the coalition that we have here in Cabell County. Um, this connect, uh, co uh, collaboration of women and agencies um, is brought together to help pregnant women, mothers, and their families navigate treatment. And what we identified was that there was a gap in services for pregnant women and women postpartum who may be referred to multiple agencies um, and services for both themselves, their children, and maybe other family members in the household, but that they were unable to actually access those services due to barriers such as transportation, unawareness about what that service might actually provide, um, just barriers when it comes to being a new mom, um, and how to navigate her recovery as part of that process. And so we developed the Healthy Connections Coalition um, to address that gap in services. And what we do is we have a team of family navigators who are paired with a mom and the family, um, and they have a, a small caseload so that they can really provide individualized attention um, to that family and identify the unique needs that that child might be, whether that's connecting to a healthcare provider or 
um, WIC services or helping them connect with uh, DHHR or state-based services, and then also coordination of care um, with other agencies who might be monitoring or working alongside of that family. Um, and so they develop a unique um, person-centered plan for each client um, and child in that family and then uh, help them connect to those services and help them connect to an in-house peer recovery coach um, who uh, is actually also in long-term recovery um, and has uh, children and so knows that sort of process um, herself. And so, as part of that, we work with many different community partners and agencies um, to access uh, those referrals and then make those connections and collaboration uh, moving forward. Just a little bit of our background so that you kind of know how this started. Um, we're a relatively new organization. We were started in 2017 um, by the Director of Addiction Services at Marshall Health at the time, Bob Hansen, um, who currently works for the West Virginia State Office of Drug Control Policy as the director of that. Um, and then Dr. Neuenhausen, um, also with Marshall Health, who is a psychologist here in our region, um, and he helped meet with these moms as part of our MARC program, which I'll address a little bit later. And so as part of the rising rate of neonatal abstinence syndrome, not only in Cabell County or Huntington, but the nation as a whole, we identified those potential gaps and developed this as a community collaborative who would be able to address those gaps effectively. So these are some of our processes. Um, like I said, it's individualized, and so each mom, um, any service she might need, that could include, um, you know, just basic pediatric care for that child or follow-up appointments for herself, um, tracking potentially her um, experience of postpartum depression or other mental health needs or substance use recovery needs that she might have, um, but then also making sure that there is this overarching um, uh, individualized approach. So if she is ready to move towards educational plans or um, workforce development or um, job obtainment, how can we help connect her to childcare or recovery positive employment agencies? Um, and so the Family Navigator provides a comprehensive assessment up front, and then if mom is currently connected in a recovery program, we're going to be connecting with that program to make sure that we're not obviously duplicating services, but that we're meeting the needs of her and that service um, agency. And then we're going to identify what basic life needs, what peer services, what types of support groups mom could benefit from, and what other family members are in the system that is needing treatment or care or collaboration. So that might be um, grandparents who are actively engaged in the raising of um, children in the family or um, the mom's partner, um, and making sure that we have all of those family members connected into the services and care. We also want to make sure that we're coordinating with those state-level support services. Um, that may include being written into safety plans um, or engaging with safety providers uh, for the children or for mom. Um, and then coordinating with our other services that we provide uh, both at Marshall Health, Marshall University, and in our community, um, which includes programs like our kids' clinic, um, our, our River Valley Care Child Care, and then making sure that when we go to handoff, to the school age um, population that we're ready to do so. And so that's one of the unique pieces is that uh, this program is, the goal is to make sure that we're tracking kids from birth to school um, and then coordinating with our school psychologists to maintain the work from there. So what do our family navigators do? Well, um, they are the individuals who are gonna conduct those initial assessments. Um, and it's a quite comprehensive assessment, but they're also gonna coordinate with other providers who may have assessed that individual. So that again, we're not duplicating services, we're not making mom fill out lengthy questionnaires or a, a long interview process because what we need to be doing is connecting her to services, but we need to know what services she might already be engaged with and what ones she could benefit from. Um, we wanna identify that you know right now as we enter uh, the winter or the holidays, some of our family navigators were working to coordinate with churches around electric bills or um, uh, restarting electric in the home. Um, they were also coordinating with um, agencies that might provide um, holiday gifts or holiday events um, for those kids. And so, again, an individualized perspective for each of our families. Um, and then they're going to coordinate with our peer recovery coaches, which is a growing program um, in Cabell County as we have uh, recovery coaches located in our ERs, we have recovery coaches located in our treatment centers and our mental health agencies. And so they're going to be making those connections so that the referrals are running two ways, so that peer recovery coaches can make referrals to our family navigators and that they can also um, be making those referrals back to peer coaches. 
Um, our family navigators also identified that moms, uh, especially those who might be using a medication to assist in their long-term recovery, were often um, stigmatized or ex potentially excluded from other types of re uh, recovery support services, especially those in the community. Um, and so they developed um, with um, active moms in our recovery support groups the uh, moms um, groups, and so those groups allow um, women who are using medication-assisted treatment and those who are not, those who are pregnant and those who are, um, have delivered their child to engage in a supportive community with other moms who have experienced um, like experiences or like life um, uh, histories. And so that allows them to have that support connection that we know is very beneficial, that peer connection. Um, we're also going to make sure that our family members are plugged in to other types of community supports we have, um, such as loved ones that might be for families who have lost someone um, to a substance use disorder, um, or our grief groups or families, um, other types of support uh, programs, uh, whether they be faith-based um, or just based in the community. Um, we also make sure that our family navigators are equipped to uh, assist in making referrals to our kids clinic, which is Knowledge in Developmental Steps. Um, and that clinic allows uh, families to come in and be assessed by a multiple, uh, multiple providers, including a pediatric neurologist, a pediatrician, um, a psychologist, social work, um, speech and hearing, communication, all of those folks at one time um, or at the same appointment um, are able to assess that child. Um, and then they're going to be making connections to our newest program um, that we'll be starting shortly, which is Center for Addiction Research, Education, and Support, which will also be providing child care to at-risk children in our community. Um, so I mentioned our, our, our Developmental Steps Kids Clinic, um, and that's a monthly one-stop shop clinic that happens here in Huntington. Um, and it meets uh, at a few different locations. As of right now, we're um, meeting um, at locations where we have access to children and, and have been requested um, to meet with kids who might be in residential programs um, or in long-term recovery programs so that we can assess the needs of those children um, using multiple medical specialists. We know that it's incredibly hard to make the referral process from the neurologist to the pathologist, the psychiatrist, the social workers, therapist, and all of those other individuals who are needed to make an adequate assessment of that child. And so this allows a one-stop shop. Um, and then it also makes sure that we're not dealing again with that transportation or referral barriers. Um, as part of that, we'll also be collecting information on those um, children so that we're seeing some of those potential long-term um, positives and successes in these families, but also any areas that we might need to reassess or provide some additional supports for the children um, so that they have long-term and healthy development. Our um, RV Cares is our uh, as I said, our newest um, component to this that has been long in the works, but it just takes a lot of uh, different parties and players to get something like this up and going. Um, it is located in the west end of Huntington, and it is managed by River Valley Child Development Services, who is a key partner um, in the Healthy Connections Coalition. And they specialize in early childhood care um, and development around children um, uh, up to and through the school age process. And so they're going to provide that specialized child care services for high risk children. Um, so a smaller ratio for those, uh, for kids who might be perceived as high risk, uh, but really it's for any child um, that could benefit from that longer and more intensive developmental process um, early, in, uh, early in their development. It also allows us to connect our Marshall students in to have firsthand experience and engagement with these families. That will allow us to um, reduce stigma towards families, um, help just increase exposure and humanizing um, the different types of people who might struggle with a substance use disorder, but be able to um, engage in long-term recovery. All right, um, so our coalition, well, it's hard to describe because it is a ton of moving parts. We have a huge number of agencies that work together. You can see there um, on your slide that there's more than 30 Huntington area agencies that are collaborating to make this successful. This is no single agency would be able to stand up a program 
um, like this on our on their own because it requires um, all types of professionals um, and different folks who have different specialties or specializations or know about the laws or uh, financial uh, burdens that someone might uh, experience and also that we're engaging that long-term recovery community and so it's a large collaborative but um, we have seen initial um, success in replicating this in other communities and so it is possible to bring these people together at least around the same table to start talking about what these families need and how we can make sure that we're serving the needs of the families without duplication um, and reducing frustration and burnout for these agencies that often see many families repeatedly um, and may struggle to provide the level of care necessary due to understaffing. Um, so Marshall Health, it is uh, one of our large partners um, in that it helps provide some of the clinical, educational, and research services um, necessary to support a program like this. Um, it is one of the, it is the home of the MARC program, the Maternal Addiction Recovery Center. If you haven't noticed yet, we do love our acronyms. Um, and so the MARC program um, engages with women at any stage of pregnancy to identify their needs um, and engage them in a medication assisted program so that they are uh, maintaining long term recovery while pregnant, both for their own health and well being, but also the safety of their unborn child. And so the MARC program uh, provides that medication assisted treatment, um, one on one therapy, and group therapy, um, along with screening and oversight um, so that those moms are tracked throughout their pregnancy um, to try and promote the healthiest outcomes for those families. Um, it also, Marshall is the employer of those family navigators um, so that we can maintain uh, training and HIPAA and all those types of needs um, that come with working uh, with what is considered a vulnerable population. Um, and it is where we're working on developing our research in collaboration with Marshall University. Um, our uh, program that most recently opened, so our kids clinic um, exists and our RV Cares is about to open, but in December we had the opportunity to open Project Hope for Women and Children. And this really is one of the first of um, its kind really in the in the country. Um, there are other programs like it, but it's rather rare, um, especially in West Virginia. And it is a residential center that has 18 apartments for women to bring their children on any pathway to recovery. And so um, it is, for those of you in mental health who might know, it's an ASAM 3.5. That means that we're providing a high level of oversight, uh, mental health, and substance use treatment in the center. It's 24 seven. Um, and so women and their children come live at Project Hope for anywhere between three to six months. Again, individualized um, approach, patient-centered care with a trauma focus um, that allows women on both medication-assisted treatment or abstinence-based programs or any pathway to recovery to engage and be provided that supportive services. And so um, that is uh, allowing those kids to be there. We're working on attachment, parenting, development, mental health, substance use treatment, um, and all of those necessary things um, to develop uh, a healthy family in the long term. Um, they're also connected to employment services um, and educational services while they're there. Um, and then another uh, Marshall Health um, initiative, um, along uh, collaborative, along with Cabell Huntington, St. Mary's, um, and uh, Thomas Health, along with Valley Health, is our PROACT. And that's a one-stop shop for treatment um, that helps coordinate services for individuals with substance use disorder um, and mental health. And so an individual can walk into PROACT, it's actually a location here in Huntington, um, and be seen immediately. And so they will have access to immediate intakes and care to identify the level of need that they might benefit from, but then also making sure that whether, you know, if they refuse or um, are not currently ready for residential treatment, although their intake denotes that might be effective for them, um, they're going to connect them to another level of service. And so they're providing individual group therapy, social services, um, they have spiritual care provided there, peer recovery, work site and job placement, um, referring out to the community, including other large mental health providers, such as Prestera Center. Um, they'll also be providing triage services, as I said on the spot, um, and medication-assisted treatment, along with all of the monitoring and group and individual that goes with medication-assisted treatment. Um, and then our, uh, one of our last programs that we wanted to highlight today is our MOMS program, and that's our Maternal Opioid Medication Support Program. And that is for women who might not have been identified 
prior to delivery, um, but they're located in Cabell Huntington Hospital um, and are requesting services following the delivery or birth of their child who may unfortunately need to spend some time in our neonatal treatment unit, our NTU, um, or Lily's Place. And so uh, women uh, in this program are offered um, services six, from delivery to six months postpartum. So it would um, identify women who might have been in the MARC program and now would like to transition or those who are not engaged in any program. And it's going to provide those counseling services, medication-assisted treatment, and medical care, along with um, collaboration with our kids' clinic and other types of residential programs. So a mom might be in the mom's program um, and unfortunately not succeeding to the place that she would like to be. And they'd make a referral, for example, to Project Hope for women and children. And so all of these are working in unison and meeting together regularly to provide that collaborative care necessary um, to make healthy and successful families um, with healthy development of children and healthy long-term relationships in hopes of breaking that cycle of addiction. So I, right there at the end, I was able to mention Lily's Place, but it's important to hear uh, more about that from the expert. Um, and so I'm uh, pleased to introduce Rebecca Crowder. She is the executive director of Lily's Place. And uh, she has been has eight years of experience in recovery administration and is responsible for overseeing the program um, strategic plan of Lily's Place. Uh, Rebecca works with the Lily's Place Board of Directors and leads staff in order to fulfill the organization's mission. She is the primary contact for all inqu inquiries concerning replication planning for any other neonatal abstinence program. And she is the co-chair of Healthy Connections. And so I am pleased to introduce uh, Rebecca Crowder. Thank you, Lynn. I appreciate that. Um, well, good morning, everyone. I, as she stated, I'm going to focus a little bit on neonatal abstinence syndrome and Lily's Place specifically. So, so we'll start with talking about neonatal abstinence syndrome. NAS is, a, is, you know, a collection of symptoms that babies go through when they're going through the withdrawal process. It occurs when the parent has had prenatal exposure to drugs and as this has discontinued suddenly at birth. So now we have these babies that go through withdrawal. And a lot of people don't stop and think, you know, we hear how hard it is for an adult to go through withdrawal. Imagine a baby goes through the exact same symptoms that an adult does with um, some additional things that are, you know, known as these um, these landmark uh, withdrawal symptoms for babies. Um, I'm sure most of you are most um, familiar with tremors. Um, the babies have visual tremors. They have feeding difficulties, excessive crying, um, and sensitivity to stimuli. And this is just a short list of the many symptoms that will occur. Um, and so with the, with the neonatal apnea syndrome, there's often a need for, um, we start with therapeutic handling techniques, and while the baby is assessed, often you'll find that pharmacological interventions are necessary to manage these withdrawal symptoms. And then the infant is slowly weaned under the supervision of the medical team off this medication. Um, when a baby goes home um, from the NTU or Lily's Place, they are off the medication, but they are still experiencing symptoms. It takes a long time for those, those to start to, to go away and to, you know, lighten. So we don't want anyone thinking these babies go home and because they're not on the medication, they're just cured. Um, they still require therapeutic handling and interventions to assist with their recovery process. West Virginia is known for having the highest rate of NAS in the country. Um, that is staggering, um, I think, to all of us. And statewide in 2017, the rate was 50.6 for every 1,000 births. Um, that was um, reported by our West Virginia Department of Health and Human Resources. In Cabell County, we saw the rate of 62.3 per 1,000 births. Um, I personally believe that we see that higher rate in Cabell County because our hospitals do do mandatory testing on every mother who comes in to give birth. Um, that is a wonderful thing because it makes sure that we don't have babies that are going home undetected because we want to be able, you know, to capture not just these, these babies but the families and help them while we're helping the babies. Lily's Place opened in 2014, and um, we were started by um, three women who, you know, really had an idea for what they wanted to do to help this community. Two of these women, Sarah Murray and Rhonda Edmonds, were nurses at Cabell Huntington Hospital, and they saw 
the increase in babies being born at the hospital who were prenatally exposed. And they just wanted to do something for these babies because they started out being um, in the NICU, which really wasn't what they felt was the most therapeutic environment for these children. So they did some research and they discovered the techniques that would be best for the babies. And they started working with Mary Brown and the three of them worked together to create the NTU at Cabell Huntington Hospital and Lily's Place. Um, and one of the things Lily's Place um, offers is, you know, we want to be able to give the non-judgmental support, education, counseling to these families and caregivers. Um, you know, there's a lot of similarities between what the hospital does and what Lily's Place does. Um, we are um, a standalone facility from the hospital, and our environment is what is slightly is, is different. Um, we work, you know, with the families just like the hospital does, but we are able um, to create, you know, um, a system right here in one location around them. We have our social workers and our peer recovery coaches and everyone right here to where when they come to see their baby, we can capture them at that one time. They're already here. Um, we work, you know, with these families to just help really with breaking this cycle of addiction. Um, here's a picture of one of our nurseries, and this is where I was talking about with the environmental differences between the hospital and Lily's Place. We are fortunate enough to have the ability to offer a private room. Um, our rooms are set up like a nursery you would see in someone's home. It's very home-like and offers a place where the families can bond, you know, have that individual space to bond and comfort their baby while they're going through the weaning process. Um, having this facility is only possible because of the support of our community. Um, every nursery in our facility is set up differently and it was all donated. We had individuals who came in and um, set up the rooms and decorated them. Our building was actually donated by the Darby family. So we were very fortunate to be able to um, truly say we are a grassroots effort that have been able to succeed because of the support we have received from our community. Um, this is a picture of our education room, and this is where the families start their training process on how to care for their baby. Um, they begin with classes and videos that teaches them not just about how to provide care for a baby born with prenatal exposure, but also basics for taking care of a baby. A lot of individuals are first-time parents, and so this gives us, you know, them being here, the opportunity to help them with those basics as well. Um, during the baby stay here, all caregivers, whether they're foster parents, biological parents, grandparents, they're given hands-on training on how to care for these babies with therapeutic handling technique methods, as well as they get additional training such as CPR and first aid. This is a picture of what we call Kevin's room. Um, Kevin's room is available as an option for anyone who's going to be caring for the baby upon their discharge. And what we offer is for them to stay here for 24 hours and take care of the child independently to, to kind of gather what they have remembered about the training and what they may need more preparation on. Um, so we have had situations where dad will stay one day for 24 hours, the next day mom will stay for 24 hours, um, sometimes it's a grandparent who stays. But this way they are um, taking care of the baby, but our nurses are here on hand to step in, intervene, check on them, and go over some of these techniques that they may need a little more assistance on. But it's really just a test run so they don't get home and become overwhelmed, feeling like they can't remember something. This gives us a chance to go over it with them again because they are given a lot of information and a lot of training while they are here. This is a picture of our clinic. Um, we offer a follow-up clinic for the babies um, that have gone through Lily's Place, and um, we are currently having this clinic twice a month. Um, we have had to increase it sometimes because we have such a large return rate. We're very fortunate. Um, when we last checked our statistics, we were at a 75% return rate on individuals who have gone through Lily's Place and come back to our clinic. Um, and so what we do at this clinic is we have a pediatric neurologist on hand, Mitzi Payne, and she, as well as a, we also have a physical therapist on hand um, with birth to three, and they will, um, you know, do the evaluation on the child and make referrals as necessary um, after seeing their progress and seeing if they need any additional services. Um, and so we are very fortunate. We still see our first child that went through our program 
come back to follow-up clinic. So it gives us a tool also just to track how these families are doing, how the children are doing, but there's also our chance to reconnect with the, the parents and see what they're doing and see if they need any additional support. Lily's Place is excited about a new pilot program that we have going on. It's rather new, and we have a partnership with the MOMS program at Cabell Huntington Hospital. We currently only offer two rooming and beds available, and this is where the mothers stay with their babies and participate in their care. Um, it's really an exciting program. You know, there has been the MOMS Rooming In project is important to both the mother and the baby. The infants have physical and emotional support from his or her mother um, who is here actively participating in the day-to-day -day care. The mother's not only trained on how to properly care for her child, she is supported by a team of professionals and peers to encourage recovery, maintenance, and build a healthier family. Um, this is in a close partnership with the MOMS program at Capitol Huntington Hospital where they receive their um, therapy services and their MAT programming. And then we have our social worker and our recovery coaches on site, and we also do a great deal of training and additional classes, parenting classes and such, with them while they are here. Um, you know, research is really suggesting this approach of care will improve outcomes related to neonatal apnea syndrome as well as lower the cost for care. Um, so we've been really excited about this program, and we, we hope to be able to expand on it at some point and offer more beds. Lily's Place has, you know, been very fortunate um, to be able to serve a number of families. At this point, we have served over 200 babies and their families. Um, we still do follow-up services with all of those that we're able to. Um, when we, for example, when we have a follow-up clinic and say someone doesn't show up or we haven't heard from them a while, we seek them out to see if there's a reason they haven't came to clinic or if there's anything else we can do for them. Um, you know, we, we work really hard to just stay in touch with these mothers and fathers and families um, and keep these families stable and intact. Um, we've been very fortunate to attract national attention and spotlight on Lily's Place, but that's not about Lily's Place. It's about being an advocate for these babies and their families. It's about having other people become aware of what is NAS, what care is required for these babies, and what is needed. Um, we are a model that can be replicated. However, unfortunately, other states really haven't been able to succeed in that. One of the reasons that Lily's Place has been successful is because the state of West Virginia really stepped up and supported Lily's Place and said, we want a, a place like this in our community. We want this in our state. We want to be able to serve these families in a different way. And so they took Lily's Place on as a project for the state, a pilot project, and that's how we got started. And it's because of their support that we've been able to operate. And unfortunately, the legislation has not quite caught up with what we're doing. We are considered kind of this, you know, square peg trying to fit in a round hole. Nobody knows where to stick an NAS center, how to label it, how to pay for it. Um, so. Um, because of that, the state of West Virginia submitted a state amendment to create a funding mechanism for places like Lily's Place in our state, but other states have not been able to quite get there yet on that. So that has become a challenge. We, do, we have other states contacting us all the time wanting to know how to do this, but um, at this point, they really just have to get their states behind them to help them, and we do hope that one day we'll be able to see facilities like this across the nation. Lily's Place's connection with Healthy connect, Connections. I think that, you know, we've been very fortunate to be involved with the Healthy Connections um, Coalition since the beginning, and we've been able to assist with this development and be part of that um, infrastructure, and I'm also um, grateful for the opportunity to be the co-chair at this time and have um, a leadership role. Um, we provide referrals to the Healthy Connections Family Navigators, and uh, we work along with all of these different groups that are part of this coalition to advocate for policies um, conducive to solving the substance use disorder epidemic that we're having here in Huntington. Um, we really just want to be a part of the solution, and we are fortunate to be a part of this group that has so many partners that we um, can be useful in many different ways. Um, 
I, you know, thank you for the opportunity to talk a little bit about Lily's Place um, and about neonatal apnea syndrome. Um, I know that uh, we, Huntington is blessed to have so many um, different groups and resources for these families, and um, I'm just glad that Lily's Place can be a small part of that. Um, so thank you all for letting me speak today. And now I would like to introduce Shannon Wright. He is with Quality Insights, and we are so grateful for the support that Quality Insights has given to um, Healthy Connections. Um, Shannon serves as Quality Insights Director of Innovation and is a, a role that involves multiple, leading multiple strategic initiatives, including efforts to infuse science, developing and facilitating the organization's innovation engine and overseeing quality insights relationships with healthy connections. He has also directed Quality Insights Home Health Quality Improvement National Campaign for more than 10 years and has more than 20 years of healthcare social marketing and branding experience. Um, so I want to um, welcome you, Shannon, and thank you so much for everything that you've done for us. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Great overview of Lily's Place and the role in Healthy Connections and um, excellent information being shared today. Keep in mind, as Crystal indicated at the beginning, you can submit your questions using the chat or Q&A feature at any time. And once our presentations are over, we'll get to as many as we can. So feel free to submit those at any time. And it's also an honor to have the first partner spotlight on the inaugural Healthy Connections webinar series, Be for Quality Insights. Uh, we in this webinar series want to dig deeper into those 30 plus members who are part of the coalition to not only learn about their role in Healthy Connections, but more about the organization in general. Because the more information we can share and the more we can collaborate, the better outcomes you're going to see related to substance use disorder or any healthcare improvement initiative. So who is Quality Insights? For some of you joining us from West Virginia, you may know us by our former name, which was the West Virginia Medical Institute, or WVMI. A couple of years ago, we rebranded our organization to reflect our regional and national reach and the fact that we are one of the largest nonprofit organizations in the country devoted solely to improving healthcare quality. Our mission is simple. We bring people and information together to improve health, which is one of the many reasons we are so pleased to be involved with Healthy Connections because it's, an, a direct, it's a direct alignment between our mission and the coalition's mission to uh, provide navigation services for people in need of substance use disorder uh, treatment services. What we do at Quality Insights is use data and community solutions to achieve the nation's goals of better health care, smarter spending, and ultimately healthier people. We have more than 300 team members, which include employees and consultants. Um, their experience spans healthcare delivery, continuous quality improvement, data analysis, IT, marketing and communications, and much, much more. We're also pleased to have recently been certified with ISO standards 9001-2015, which shows that uh, we are providing high quality services to our customers regardless of who they are. A customer focus is a key component of everything we do at Quality Insights, including health improvement. Uh, we certainly support the national quality strategy and serve customers spanning from government agencies, private foundations, and private organizations as well. Um, we have provider solutions, we have programs and system solutions, and also work with patients and communities. For providers, we provide quality improvement services, quality reporting, care management, learning and diffusion, practice transformation, and we engage patients in many ways with educational resources and networking opportunities. For programs and systems, we offer population health management, chronic disease management, provider, stakeholder, and patient engagement, measurement design, and secure data collection, analytics, and reporting. And last but not least, of course, we work with patients and community solutions on health education campaigns, like a lot of what we're doing for Healthy Connections. I'll share a little bit more about that coming up. We also work with patient uh, education and engagement, peer-to-peer -peer learning, wellness, and public health as well. So some, what are some of our major projects? Well, just a sampling of them, we have a pretty diverse portfolio. For the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or Medicare, 
First of all, we serve as a Quality Innovation Network Quality Improvement Organization, or QIN QIO, and a End Stage Disease Renal in stage renal disease network. Uh, and in these two projects, we collaborate with nearly 17,000 providers and 1,300 partners to improve healthcare as a QIO for f uh, five states and an ESRD beyond that as well. And that covers 5 million people with Medicare and patients with end stage renal disease. Also, for uh, Medicare, we are the national organizer of uh, CMS's Home Health Quality Improvement National Campaign where we provide evidence-based education, secure individualized data reports, and support to more than 6,000 Medicare certified home health agencies consisting of more than 22,000 individuals nationwide. We're also the one and only organization performing external peer review for the Veterans Health Administration. In this project, we collect <clears throat> quality of care data from every Veterans Health Administration facility in the nation and provide leadership with the information they need to transform the quality of care provided to our veterans. Now, these projects, where do they reach at Quality Insights? As I mentioned, we reach the nation. That's one reason for our rebrand to become Quality Insights. We uh, serve uh, veterans and home health patients across the nation. Um, our end-stage renal disease network for kidney patients spans nine states and U.S. territories, and our quality improvement work is in five states, as you can see here. This adds up to more than five million people with Medicare in these five states alone. So we are very, very pleased to be able to make this impact on health care regionally and nationally. But for those of you here in West Virginia, we are a West Virginia based organization. That's where our corporate headquarters are in Charleston. And we're now in our 46th year of improving health and health care quality uh, as an organization. So just a sampling of some of the results of these projects. Um, we have calculated more than $220 million in cost savings through our home health project by averting hospitalization to um, more than 6,000 home health agencies. We've also calculated $86 million in cost savings through 7,500 averted hospitalizations by working in community coalitions in our five states and, and more than uh, 800 medical providers. And we've also seen the results of uh, more than 5,000 fewer patients being on antipsychotic drugs and more than 2,200 getting flu shots, working with more than 1,200 skilled nursing facilities. So that's just a selection of some of the results we've been able to achieve in some of our core work at Quality Insights. But back to the topic at hand, what is the connection with Healthy Connections? How did Quality Insights become involved? Well, in 2017, our organization launched a new three-year strategic plan to drive innovation and growth throughout our organization. One component of this strategic plan included contributing to a project addressing substance use disorder. And when I say contributing, I mean in kind, providing our experience to help benefit an organization addressing this topic. Uh, through extensive research, we first identified the unique collaborative approach that was being undertaken right here in our backyard by Healthy Connections, just down the road in Huntington. Uh, once we identified the organization, we were able to coalesce our relationship with Healthy Connections with the assistance of State Senator and Associate Vice President of Economic Development for the Marshall University Research Corporation, Bob Plymel, who's been a longtime Quality Insights friend and also deeply involved with efforts to address substance use disorder in the Huntington area. He helped the relationship come together and now Quality Insights is providing more than $1 million of in-kind services through the end of 2020. And what do those services involve? Well, our role with Healthy Connections largely centers of around marketing and branding. Um, we want to make sure people are aware of Healthy Connections, not just people in need of the services, but also stakeholders, community partners, and other individuals so that they know about this approach, can become involved in the local area, or potentially replicate this collaborative model in another area to help people achieve long-term recovery. 
Um, our branding services include development of a style guide. I will give all credit to the original Healthy Connections logo, though, to our member, Greg Perry, who is with Recovery Point West Virginia, who designed the original Healthy Connections logo, of which um, uh, we did not want to change. It's a beautiful logo and a beautiful brand, and many thanks to uh, Greg for the original development of that that we have run with and since uh, used in a wide variety of materials including developing the web infrastructure for Healthy Connections. The uh, website is at uh, healthyconnectionswv.org or if you don't like to type that much you can just put in hcwv.org. Uh, we launched that website just last year and continue to grow and add more resources to it all the time. We also assist with um, partnership coordination, helping facilitate Healthy Connections meetings, bring everyone together. We have long-standing experience with uh, coalition management and coalition engagement, so we uh, employ some of those best practices to help Healthy Connections coordinate its membership and its partners. We also uh, create resources, including posters, brochures, rack cards, and other informational services, all to reinforce the Healthy Connections brand. We assist in earned media, which for those of you who aren't in public relations, basically means generation of news coverage and helping uh, to get uh, the word out about Healthy Connections, its services, and about stigma reduction related to substance use disorder by partnering with television, radio, newspaper, and online resources as well to share information. And we're also helping with advertising, which will be part of a uh, larger campaign slated to launch in 2019 that I'll tell you a little bit more about coming up. But first, let's highlight some of the successes of our partnership, which uh, we've been working with Healthy Connections for uh, just a little over a year now. It's a, it's a pretty new relationship, but we are so excited to be learning from all of the experts involved in this coalition and to be able to contribute by uh, providing printed materials. As I mentioned, we have various brochures, rack cards, posters, those types of things that uh, can be used by any Healthy Connections member. We also launched the website and social media presences, not just the uh, healthyconnectionswb.org website, but we, are also, um, we also have Facebook and other social media platforms. That all took place at an event that you see referenced here, the Moving Forward Together event. You can see we, we've pictured that. And at that, we kicked off Recovery Month and launched our website with the debut of an authentic video featuring an individual who has been through Healthy Connections and been very successful with the program. Her name is Misty, and the video is called She Has a Name. I invite you to visit healthyconnectionswv.org to view this video short. It's very powerful and helps reduce stigma and uh, really shows people um, how by working together, um, um, you know, success can be achieved. Uh, we've also worked on other events uh, with Healthy Connections, including a next chapter uh, celebration for founding member Louis Neuenhausen as he left the area. Uh, we helped uh, with the promotion of the first annual All Walks of Recovery, which took place at Marshall University as part of Recovery Month in September 2018. Uh, that was a very well attended event uh, where people came together to celebrate recovery and remember those who we've lost uh, to substance use disorder. In addition to those in-person events, this launches the first in our webinar series. I mentioned we're going to be putting on uh, webinars for Healthy Connections throughout 2019 and 2020 as well, uh, digging deeper into not only the partners and what their role is, but some of the components that we've talked about today, like what is specifically involved with that. So more to come on our future webinars here at Healthy Connections. So for next steps, we'll have additional webinars. We'll also be launching an e-newsletter soon, and we'll make sure and share that information with you and invite you to share it with others as well so you can stay connected with what's happening at Healthy Connections. Coming up in 2019 will be an intensive outreach campaign. I mentioned earlier the advertising component of our partnership. When we launch this campaign, we'll be sharing specific Healthy Connection services, such as the Kids Clinic that uh, Lynn mentioned earlier. We're also going to be working to reduce substance use disorder stigma among people in need of services, but also among the community, healthcare providers, and others. So uh, that will be a, a large-scale effort throughout the Huntington area throughout 2019. 
And our uh, researchers are working with Marshall's researchers to develop evaluation mechanisms so that we can measure the most effective strategies and messages for reducing stigma and reaching individuals in need of substance use disorder treatment services. So not only will this be a visible type approach, but it will also be a measurement approach so that we can um, document what's working, share it with others as best practices, and continue to expand this movement toward recovery in the Huntington area. With that, I'm gonna turn things back over to your MC, Crystal Welch. Crystal is the lead project coordinator with Quality Insights, and she assists in our overall mission of providing education, data, networking, and assistance to bring people and information together to improve health. Crystal is the primary contact for Quality Insights in regard to healthy connections and aids the coalition in providing an online infrastructure, social marketing services, and studies to determine the effectiveness of multimedia campaigns. Crystal serves as the Recording and Corresponding Secretary for the Coalition and Co-Chair, alongside me, of Healthy Connections Media, Marketing, and More, or 3M Committee. With that, it's my great pleasure to turn things back over to Crystal Welch. Well, thank you, Shannon, very much. And um, I think now we have uh, reached the portion of our webinar uh, for our, our Q&A. Uh, so uh, we have several questions already in the queue, and so you can just use the chat or the QA function in your WebEx player, and, and we will address, address many of, uh, as many of those questions as we have time, and if not, we can always post these questions and answers on our Healthy Connections website. And I realize that we're almost to the top of the hour, so I'm gonna start um, with many questions already. Uh, our first question, uh, I think maybe I'll just uh, toss it over to Lynn. The question says, some people in the community say babies are born addicted to a drug, some say exposed. What is the most accurate description? All right, thank you. Um, so the most accurate description would be an infant is born with exposure to a substance. Um, so the correct uh, way is that we don't want to refer ever to infants as being born addicted, um, as that is medically inaccurate. Um, addiction involves craving of the object of addiction, loss of control over its use, and continued involvement despite adverse consequences. And so for an individual to be diagnosed with an addiction of any kind, um, not just to a substance, it involves those three criteria. And so an infant does not meet that criteria, um, and rather they are born with exposure to a substance, and that could be any substance. They can be born with exposure to caffeine, they can be born with exposure to tobacco, or they could be uh, born with exposure to an, uh, legally or um, illegal opioid use. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we use stigma-free language when talking about these children um, and their experience. And so no language ever should be used, such as a drug baby um, or addicted babies, um, but rather infants with exposure, infants with neonatal abstinence syndrome, or infants experiencing withdrawal. Wonderful, thank you so much. And thanks so much for that question because that really helps us to um, uh, with our language of, of stigma, so thank you for that question. Uh, the next question um, is for Rebecca. It says, I love the collaboration I hear you talk about. I heard you say the state is supportive of this effort, and I would like to know if Lily's Place sees referrals from other hospitals statewide, and does the state need more than one of these models? Okay, thank you for that question. Um, yes, Lily's Place does receive referrals from other um, hospitals statewide, and I feel that um, between the NTU and Lily's Place, we are able to provide the support needed for our region, and we most often serve families that live an hour and a half to two hours out. But once you get further than that, it's challenging for the families to get here and to be as involved as, you know, we would really like them to. So I do think that um, that it is something that is needed um, in, 
in the other end of the state. We have had a baby here before that came from the Eastern Panhandle. Um, so this is something where we do try to serve anyone who is in need. But I have heard Secretary Crouch state that he would like to see another facility like Lily's Place in a different location in the state because with the travel issues, it's just complicated for them to utilize the services here. Um, but I do feel like we do a really good job within a couple hours radius. Um, we have families, you know, one and a half, two hours out that still even come back for the follow-up clinics and to see their peer recovery coaches that they have had here. Um, so I do think, you know, it is needed and it is something I do think we will see. Part of the challenge of why we have not seen that yet is the state is still working. They worked very hard to get the amendment um, submitted for Medicaid to get reimbursements, and they are still finalizing all of that. We don't know yet what those reimbursement rates are going to be. And I think once they get everything stable and flowing, they may look at the options of what they can do for the rest of the state. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is for Shannon. Uh, Shannon, what will the reach be for the marketing campaign? Will Lawrence County, Ohio be included? Thank you, Crystal, and thank you for the question as well. That is a great question. Uh, in short, yes, uh, we'll be targeting the Huntington, Ashland, Ironton media market, of which um, Lawrence County, Ohio is certainly included. Uh, components of the campaign will include a partnership with uh, local radio outlets, not only on traditional advertising, but also on specific stigma reduction efforts that can be weaved into everyday programming. So certainly uh, the partners that we're looking at through the local radio market uh, will be reaching Lawrence County, Ohio. We're also looking at uh, targeted digital marketing, which I'm sure for uh, folks will have a spillover uh, throughout the media market as well. Another component will be billboard and busboard advertising. So um, we're certainly uh, probably going to target our kids clinic um, uh, messaging toward that audience to make sure people know about those services uh, that exist as well. So uh, we anticipate this all uh, kicking off uh, in 2019 and um, would certainly welcome everyone's feedback on any of the materials, messages, or components of the campaign that, um, that you see once it launches. So thank you for the question, and I hope that addresses it adequately. It does, and we are at the top of the hour. Um, I'm going to take one more question, even though we have a few more, um, but the, the one that seems to be uh, recurring is how does the referral process to Healthy Connections work? Do you take self-referrals from mothers uh, in recovery? Um, Lynn, if you don't care to tackle that one. No problem. Um, so the referral process for Healthy Connections, um, we have a phone number that individuals can call if they're interested in connecting, and that could be a self-referral, that could be an information gathering, that could be the loved one of someone who might want to be connected to these services, and that number is 304-696-3641, and that would connect you to our kids' clinic um, if you were interested in, in receiving services there. Um, and then you can call our River Valley CARES phone number, and that would be 304-429-3882. Um, and as Shannon has said quite a few times, the best place to get information and connect with us is going to be healthyconnectionswv.org or hcwv.org. But we would not turn a referral down from anyone, and so you would be able to connect with our family navigators, um, our kids clinic, or RV CARES, um, and find all of that information on our website, and then be connected to a family navigator who could process that intake or make a connection to another service if you did not feel as though Healthy Connections um, was the service you were trying to identify, but there was another community-based need that you wanted to engage with. Um, our family navigators will not discriminate and would make sure that we could provide those services to you. And if you're just interested in getting involved with Healthy Connections, again, get on our website and connect with us, and we would be more than happy to have you join us at our monthly meeting. Perfect. Thank you. Well, seeing as we are almost to the top of the hour, I have uh, advanced the slides to the presentation recap for today. And then I also wanted to uh, just put this out. Uh, well, I spoke with Dr. Michael Kilkenny. He's the physician officer at, at um, Cabell Hankton Health Department earlier this week, and we were talking about harm reduction. But he reminded me of this quote, and we thought it was a great way to end today's webinar. Uh, programs that we've mentioned today, um, the MARC program, the MOMS program, uh, PROACT, 
Kids Clinic, um, uh, Project Hope, all of these are points of connection for many hundreds of our citizens in the Huntington area who are stigmatized, marginalized, and disconnected by substance abuse. So we just thought that we wanted to uh, let us all remember that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, the opposite of addiction is connection. And that's certainly what we are trying to do here with Healthy Connections. So with that, um, what we want to do is, is look about how uh, uh, you can help us. So we're happy that you joined our About Us and How You Can Help uh, webinar, so the How You Can Help portion of it. You can feel free to join us, as Lynn said, on the second Thursday at 11 a.m. each month at River Valley Child Development Services located on 7th Avenue. Another way to help is with stigma reduction. Uh, Healthy Connections will be focusing on the stigma reduction campaign, as Shannon spoke of, uh, throughout 2019. And please um, watch the She Has a Name video if you have not viewed that on our website. Another way to remember is to um, uh, to really remember that words do matter, as Lynn said, uh, to avoid uh, such words as uh, addicted uh, for babies uh, and, and using um, negative speech. So just to avoid negative speech when speaking of substance use disorder is a great way to help us out. And another way is to help to help us out is to display or distribute our Healthy Connections RAC cards. There's one shown here to the right. And we would be happy to uh, get those to you if you request some uh, so for your offices or locations. So just uh, contact us on our website and we'll be happy to get those for you. And finally, don't forget to like us on Facebook and share our posts. So that's something you can certainly help us with as well. So to wrap up uh, things up, as soon as the webinar concludes, you will be immediately re redirected to provide input on a feedback form. So please let us know your thoughts. And also feel free to contact any of the speakers from today's webinar. Uh, the emails are listed on this slide. So once again, at the top of the hour, thank you for attending today. Thank you also for those listening by recording. We realize how busy uh, your schedules are, and we hope you found the content discussed today very helpful. And we look forward to uh, you joining us on future webinars for Healthy Connections, where we'll spotlight other community partners as we continue to work with all points of connection for the Huntington area. This concludes our webinar. Have a pleasant day, and don't forget to complete the feedback form. Goodbye. <laughs>